The theory of constraints is a simple, actually it's a simple set of, of steps or guidelines that um, allow us to actively manage the constraint. Okay, So it, it focuses, it's big picture oriented. Because we remember, sort of, from our uh, you know our project management experience, is that it's not necessarily uh, hyper focusing on an activity that determines how long a, a project or a process will take, but it's how the whole system operates, the whole critical path. What does that look like? Determines how long a project or a process takes. So this is a big. Picture theory of constraints is just a big picture look at how we manage the constraints. Okay, so we we look at workflows. We it's a, again we're systems oriented, not just one activity. Our goal is not just to maximize the productivity out of an activity and do that for every activities activity and assume that we're going to get something great. No, right? No different than when we we're in project management and we wanted to reduce the duration of a project. Did we crash every project? Or every activity, excuse me? No. We were selective. We crashed activities that were on the critical path, ones that were important. So this, think of how the system flows. You know, would we would we uh, get another grill? Would we get would when we're thinking of when we're making the hamburgers? Did we need more hamburger assemblers? Hamburger assemblers? Hamburger ham hamburglers? Hamburger assembly people? No, right? They had six seconds spare every minute. We didn't need more of those folks. We could zero in on those. Right. Oh, hey, there's this new machine so you can assemble hamburgers faster. It would be very efficient. It would make a, that, that activity so efficient. Let's do it. It's efficiency. <laughs> what difference does it make? It's wasted money. right? Why is it wasted money? Because you know what? The cooking process is still going to only do 20 burgers a minute. Okay. So again, we look at the, we look at the system. Now, in that process of looking at the system, we're, we're talking about flow, right? Flow, not capacity. Making each step like have, oh, we can look, we do bazillions of it at this super duper Halo 1476 machine that assembles burgers, 100 burgers in less than five seconds. Not interested. We can't keep the, the cook can't keep up with the system we already have. We're not interested. Okay. So and just like in project management where we zeroed in on the critical path, TOC theory of constraints zeroes in on the constraints. Not so much worried about non-constraint processes or activities or non-constrained resources, if you want to look at it that way. Now, part of the this process is we, we identify, and we'll see this in the steps, and it's going to be step one, we're going to identify the bottleneck. We're going to identify the constraint. Now, once we've identified that, so for instance, when we were making hamburgers, we identified the cooking process as the constraint. We want to never be short of resources to keep feeding that bottle, that, that particular bottleneck. So if cooking was the constraint and we had an ongoing operation of making hamburgers, we would want to ensure that at the cooking phase, they always had patties to put on that grill. We would never want to have a situation where they were waiting for uh, hamburger patties to arrive because then that would uh, be what we call starving the bottleneck. I want to make sure that because the bottleneck resource dictates how long everything takes, we want to ensure that the bottleneck resource is always busy, always at 100%. The other stuff, eh, okay, so the assemblers, uh, do they need the, the Halo 1460? No, they don't. Right? They don't need the fancy assembly machine. The, the, that process is, is uh, 
outperforming the, the cooking process anyway. We don't need to we don't need to build even more slack in, in that segment. Okay. So step one, identify the bottleneck. Uh, how, how, or they call it the system constraint. But, but the bottleneck, how, how, how do we address it? How do we do anything related to the bottleneck if we don't know what the heck it is, right? So first step is what is that constrained resources, right? When we identified uh, the cooking was the constrained resource, how did we know that? Well, we looked at it and said, hey, that cooking face is going at 100%. It's busy all the time, Right? Whereas the assembly phase, yeah, they had six seconds of slack time for every minute. So they weren't going all the time. Their capacity was not at 100%. So one of the biggest, the biggest thing that screams out, hey, I'm a bottleneck, is if you're, cons if, uh, you're consuming all the available capacity. You're using all the capacity. And if you remember back to your linear programming days in your... In Finance 113, again, soon to be called Management Science 113, uh, we focused in on the constraints, and which was a binding constraint. A binding constraint was one where we used, the amount that we used was the same as the amount that we had. We were using all that we had. It's the same thing here when we start to identify the system constraint. Right? Capacity is 100%. We're using all the capacity that we have, which is what was happening at the cooking phase. We could do 20 burgers. 20 burgers per minute was our max. We were doing 20 burgers per minute. Going at 100%, there is your constraint. There's your bottleneck right there. Now, the fun one, step two. This is where, this is the money step. Right? Decide how to exploit the constraint. Now what makes this like the key thing, the key, this is the, this is, ooh, this is the big stuff, is that we have to figure out ways to maximize the throughput of that particular constraint that we identified in step one without spending a whole lot of money. Ooh, wow, right? How can we improve the bottleneck without the expenditure of money? I mean, it doesn't take a huge genius if you got all the money and all the resources to come up with some way to improve or to to improve a given bottleneck or constraint. Okay, that's yeah, that's you know whatever. But using your brain, using your creativity. To come up with a slightly better way. It doesn't have to be massively better. Right? It could be incremental improvement is still improvement. Come up with a way that we can rearrange what we currently have, maybe with a couple of alterations that don't cost too much. That in then increases the throughput of the bottleneck resource. That is the key. That that's that's the whole big of operations management right there in step two. Next step, step three, is this thing called subordinate other activities um, to the bottleneck, essentially. So we don't want non-bottleneck resources overwhelming the bottleneck resource, which means if I have one process, let's just visualize with me, close your eyes, visualize with me, we go from A to B, I know, very boring. Right? And A can put out um, 10 widgets a minute. I hate the word widget, but I don't know what to use right now. A puts out 10 widgets per minute, but B can only output 8 widgets per minute. Right? So B does it, A does its thing, poof, 10 widgets come out. B does its thing, but it can only do 8 widgets a minute. Well, what's going to happen? Well, <laughs> there's this spare two widgets that A is pumping to B. That's starting to pile up, right? Right in front of B. B's got all these widgets that they haven't been able to get to that are piling up and piling up because B can only output eight widgets and A is sending them ten. Right? You got inventory happening all over the inventory problems all over the place. Working capital is is being consumed with all these spare widgets that B can't deal with because B can only do eight widgets a minute. 
So what we need to go is we need to go to the folks in A in the process and go, hold on, love it that you can do a 10. You got to slow her down. Slow it down. Do only eight. Because these guys in B can't keep up. Okay. And then A sends B eight widgets. Then B then puts out eight widgets. Maybe there's a couple of widgets of inventory that, that B keeps just in case the B guys are like, Ooh, we're in the zone. We did eight, nine widgets this minute. And they, they're looking for the extra widget and you have it there in inventory and you can they can do nine widgets and then they're going to regress back to their mean again and they're going to be going back to their eight widget case, right? Okay, so we don't want to, we'll have, maybe that's where inventory, the whole inventory management unit, which is coming up next, uh, deals with how do we, how do we manage that? And just to connect it a little bit of, uh, for, uh, what you, I wish I was more literate, you know, we sort of foreshadowing, that's the word I'm looking for, foreshadowing. Waiting lines. What is this? This is a waiting line. How do waiting lines develop? It's when A is pumping out more stuff than B can handle. More cars are hitting the road than the road can handle. At any one moment. <coughs> waiting line. Congestion. Right? Same kind of thing. And so we don't want that waiting line building up in front of B too much. But we want to have a little bit of inventory there is so that B is always busy. Right? So there's the foreshadowing for the next two units and how they tie into this process. But step, step three is just essentially slowing down A so A is outputting just enough that B can handle it. B being the constraint. Step four, okay. Let's open up the budget. Let's elevate the constraint and that's where we can add uh, capacity, upgrade capacity, imp you know, go with new machinery, add new machinery, perhaps add another line, hire more people, that kind of stuff. So those are things that we can do when we can expend. Uh, we do uh, have some money available to uh, to spend on it. Okay, so not as exciting as step two where you're improving without spending money because, oh, wow, that's like super awesome, right? Hey, we made it better. How much did it cost? Oh, not much at all. Ha oh, ha, awesome. Keep it up, right? Uh, so uh, step two is the biggest step. That's the most important step. Step three is important. Step four is good too. Um, but yeah, you know, it's not as much creativity in step four. And then lastly, step five. If anything has changed, go back to step one again. And we're always, it's a, it's a process of continual evaluation. And there is nothing that says that just because you were constrained once and then we've made that constraint better, that that constraint doesn't change to something else. Okay, Just like we could have multiple critical paths or have another critical path up here. Same idea here with constraints. We could uh, improve one particular process enough that it's no longer the constraint something else is so boom now we go and we address that we identify that it's the constraint we exploit that constraint we subordinate other activities to that constraint we elevate that constraint and then we go back to step five and we reevaluate again and it's never ending it's a process of continual improvement and that is our basic steps in the theory of constraints. So nothing terribly complicated, but boy, at step two can be tricky. At step one is gonna involve some math. At step three, that's a whole management item in and of itself, right? That's step three is starting to think considerations of waiting lines and inventory management there. And as, you, as we get into those units, we can say that, that those, those particular aspects are, are complicated Right? So the idea, the big picture approach is easy. The components can be, can be deceptively tricky, uh, but that's what makes operations exciting, right? right? There's just a lot of moving parts going on here. Okay, so uh, let's look at just one last thing. It's just 
looking at it in the context of a manufacturing uh, process. So first step is um, we're, we're going to identify and you know we have to sort of always consider uh, that there are uh, setup times when we, we switch when we're switching uh, around particular a uh, particular line or a process amongst different products there's a there's a setup uh, we call it, call it mob and demob but there's a certain you know get it set up take down setup kind of process okay we always want to keep that bottleneck uh, as busy as possible middle minimize idle time at the at the bottleneck Pre preferably eliminate but minimize okay uh, now the more times we do uh, the setup and take up and take downs, uh, that takes time, right? That's again idle time, but potentially at the bottleneck. So switchovers from blue t-shirts to red t-shirts. Um, we want to do that a few times as possible. Not saying never do it because we can't just sell blue t-shirts, uh, but we want to minimize that. So that's that's a, a big time management process. And then we can focus in on capacity. Uh, we start to think of, okay, well, if we did fewer setups and set, set downs, or if we did uh, certain shirts at a certain time of the day and cer certain shirts at a different time of the day, we can reduce these setup uh, costs, right? And that's a way to sort of exploit the bottleneck without costing you a lot of money, just by scheduling, proper scheduling. Um, and then we can always uh, add capacity, you know, step four, um, work longer, right? Over time, more people, more machines, uh, that kind of idea. Okay. Now, next uh, unit segment is we're going to talk about how do we identify that bottleneck and uh, and uh, what is the bottleneck uh, and what product mix should we we pr producing. Okay. So, a little bit of identification of bottlenecks, and then now we start that process of allocating our resources towards the products and services that maximize our profit okay. or minimize our cost or achieve uh, the most efficiency in other words okay we are going to talk about the traditional method versus the bottleneck method uh, I'm only look at the traditional method as saying hey look at that method that's bad it's dumb if you want to go through the example and see how how it doesn't stack up, by all means. I'm going to focus in on the bottleneck method in the next unit, just so that um, you don't think that they're too equally, uh, I want to say valid, but equally valid um, methods they are not. Bottleneck method is the preferred. Uh, traditional method is sometimes that gut way that people look at things. That, and we can kind of see that sometimes the, the obvious intuition way of looking at things is not necessarily the best way. Okay, stay tuned for that.